Today on Mike Attempts, Fixing Angle Grinders. A local fabrication shop gave me a literal trunkful of broken tools. In the pile were these eight Makita 9005B angle grinders. I didn't realize it at the time, but this model is one of the best corded angle grinders you can buy. And at around $200, they aren't cheap. Some of the issues are obvious but I'll be troubleshooting and testing to determine why they all failed. I numbered each one so I don't get them mixed up. First, let's see if they spin. Number six won't turn, but the rest feel fine. Next, I'll remove the brushes. Number one's brushes are completely worn down. Some tools will stop working when the brushes wear down to a specific point. Number two still have plenty of life left. Number threes look good too. Fours are a bit smaller. Fives are about the same as number four. Same for number six. Number sevens are all used up. And number eights brushes look okay. Let's crack them open. With the four screws removed, the gear housing can be pulled off. No visible signs of damage. You may have noticed the different Makita logo on number one. It appears to be older than the others and the bearings don't feel very smooth. Four more screws and now we can open the housing. The gears look good. No mangled or missing teeth. From what I can see, the stator looks okay. I ended up re-securing this side of the grip to the body to make them easier to handle. With my multimeter set to continuity and one lead on each terminal, the switch is working properly. I'll test the stators and armatures later. Besides being dirty, number two's armature looks fine. And the bearings sound good. Again, it's dirty in there, but no obvious damage. The grease looks almost new. It must have had a short life. The vents show signs of heat damage. Number two switch is also working as expected. As I disassemble the rest, I'll stop to show any damage, failed testing, or anything else that's worth pointing out. Number three's grease looks pretty fresh too. There appears to be a dark area right here on number three stator. Number four also has a possible burn mark in almost the same spot.
No surprises with number five. Number six is the one that wouldn't spin. After some back and forth, it seems to have freed up. There's a gouge mark in the armature. There are also similar marks on the inside of the stator. This sliver of metal could be the culprit. It was probably jammed between the armature and the stator. Everything looks good with number seven. Last but not least, number eight has a large burn in the same area of the stator. Before testing, I'll clean the commutators. This is the area that the carbon brushes ride on. I used a strip of 400 grit sandpaper to shine up each commutator. Now we can test the armatures for shorted or broken windings. With my multimeter set to 200 ohms, I started with the 180 degree test. This will test the resistance between the commutator bars directly across from each other. We're not looking for a specific value, just consistency between each pair of bars being measured. If the value is significantly higher or lower for one pair, that's an indication of a damaged winding. Next, I'll perform the bar-to-bar -bar test. This will test the resistance between the commutator bars next to each other. Again, you're looking for consistent measurements between each pair. Lastly, I'll perform our continuity test. I check between the commutator bars and the steel stack, as well as the armature shaft. There shouldn't be any continuity for these tests. If the multimeter beeps, there's a short. If the armature fails any of these tests, it's likely damaged. Luckily, all eight armatures passed all three tests. So what's the verdict for each angle grinder? Number one's power cord has been cut and was previously replaced with a three wire cord. The extra unused wire made the cord thicker and the strain relief boot had to be cut to fit. The brushes are shot and the bearings sound a little rough. I tested each stator, also known as the field coil, and they all passed except number two, three, and four. Each brush holder should only have continuity between either the white or black wires. If there's continuity from one wire to both brush holders, there's a short. If you're only able to get continuity between one or neither of the brush holders, there's a break in the wire. There also shouldn't be any continuity between the two brush holders. Number two had continuity everywhere, which means there's a short. Number three didn't have continuity anywhere, so it must have broken wires. Broken wires for number four as well. Here's an example of a good stator. This brush holder has continuity to the white wire, but not the black. And vice versa for the other brush holder. Also, no continuity between the brush holders. There were no cuts or signs of severe wear on number 5's power cord. But a continuity test with the multimeter shows there's a break in the black wire. Number six had a piece of metal jammed between the armature and the stator. I'm pretty sure that's the only issue. Number seven looks fine, except for the smoked brushes. And number eight also has a bad stator. The odd thing is that when testing, I couldn't find any shorts or broken wires. But this burn is pretty conclusive, so maybe the fault only shows up once it starts getting hot. This was my first time troubleshooting electric motors, but if my testing was accurate, there are no failed switches or armatures. I'm going to remove the stators from number 2, 3, 4, and 8 to see the full extent of the damage.
I used a long flathead screwdriver to pop the spring connections off from around the brush holders. Then I clipped off the zip tie and disconnected the wires. Some of the stators were tighter than others. There are more burnt areas on the bottom. Number two got so hot that it melted through this copper wire. The damage on number three is very similar. The white wire on number four was completely burned off. And number eight has a couple scorch marks on the bottom too. Now that the stators have been removed, let me try to quickly show the tests again. This is one coil with white wires at each end. This is a separate coil with black wires. There should be continuity between the black wires and continuity between the white wires. There shouldn't be continuity between any wire and the steel stack. There also shouldn't be continuity between any combination of black and white wires. The ohms reading between the two coils should be the same as well. And even though this stator passed all tests, there's obviously a failure. In a bad stator, the ohms reading will usually be different for each coil. Number two literally had continuity between everything. While number three had continuity between nothing. Number four lacked appropriate continuity and had a short between the black brush holder wire and the steel stack. Before ordering new bearings for number one, I'd like to see if they can be cleaned and re-greased. I gently pried up on the inner edge of the plastic shield until it popped out. Then I removed the nylon bearing cage. Most of the grease is gone, but the balls and races look good. I used WD-40 and a cotton swab stick to clean the inside. Mobile Polyrex EM seems to be the best choice for electric motor bearings. I repacked the bearing, evenly separated the balls, reinstalled the cage, and snapped the shield back into place. While I wait for parts, time to clean the gear housings. I whipped out the bulk of the grease and then threw them in the ultrasonic cleaner. It took forever, but they're all clean now. I blew them dry with compressed air and gave each needle bearing a squirt of WD-40. All the bevel gears are in good shape, but if you need to replace the bearing, the large gear is held in place with a snap ring. The shaft is keyed, so don't lose it. There's a larger snap ring retaining the bearing. All of the bearings sounded good, so I added a few drops of gear oil before putting them back together. Some gears didn't want to come off, so I picked up an inexpensive puller made for small bearings. 
It was almost too small for the large bevel gear, but it did the job. Now that I have this little puller, I can remove the small bevel gear to repack number one's other armature bearing. I repeated the cleaning and regreasing process. The only difference was that this bearing had a metal cage that couldn't be removed. The smaller gear is supposed to sit below the top of the shaft. So after pounding it flush, I used my press to get it the rest of the way down. The new parts have arrived. I got five handles, two power cords, not sure why they're gray, eight sets of brushes, and four staters. I spent around $290 for parts, but considering that these grinders retail for over $200 each, it felt justified. Time to put them back together. Number one needs a power cord and brushes. Be sure the bottom armature bearing is completely seated. I didn't want to clean out my grease gun, so I loaded the grease into a Ziploc bag and cut off the corner. I tried to put in as much grease as I took out. You do not want the housing completely packed full. I applied some grease to the gears as well. The black plate should be oriented like this. When driving coarse threaded screws into plastic, it's helpful to slowly turn them backwards until you feel a click. Then you can screw them into their original threads without accidentally cutting new ones. Here are the new brushes next to the old ones. The cord is next. I reused the strain relief boot, and since the bottom half was missing, I wrapped electrical tape around the new cord for a tight fit. I stripped the wires and crimped a ring terminal on the black one. With it reassembled, it's the moment of truth. Sounds great, and very torquey. Number two needs a new stator. Feed the long wires through the two rear holes. The new stator was tight. So I tapped it down with a plastic rod. Now I have to figure out how to get the copper springs around the outside of the brush holders. After many failed attempts, I was able to press on the flat crimp with a chopstick and work the spring around the brush holder with curved forceps. For the other side, where the crimp was at the bottom, I used needle nose vice grips to hold it in place while using a pick to stretch the spring and a screwdriver to pop it into place. If there's anyone watching who knows an easier way to do this, please let me know in the comments. Insert the baffle plate and tighten the screws. I zip tied, stripped, crimped, and connected the wires. The rest of the assembly was the same.
There's plenty of meat on the old brushes, so I'm gonna reuse them. Let's test it out. Another one fixed. Number three needs a stator too. This one wasn't as tight and could be pressed into place by hand. The brush holder wires went on a little easier this time. Whoops, I almost made a big mistake. Did you catch it? I forgot to install the baffle plate and the stator screws. Number three's old brushes are still good too. Here we go. Nice. Number four also needs a stator, so it's going to be pretty much the same as the last two. If the holes aren't aligned after inserting the new stator, just give it a few taps to get them lined up. My brush wire technique was getting better with each stator. While these brushes would still work, they're pretty worn, so I might as well replace them. Place your bets. <laughs> Fixed. <laughs> Number five has internal cord damage. The black wire is broken. I slid the old strain relief on the new power cord and wired it up. I finished putting it back together, slapped in some new brushes, and It's good. Number six was the one that was jammed up by a piece of metal. After some fresh grease and new brushes, it should be good to go. Works. Number seven's brushes were worn down to a nub, and I think that was the only problem. Oh yeah. Finally the last one, and it's another stator install. Brush wires connected, switch wired, greased, reused the old brushes, and done. Oh, I almost forgot. Feel free to rate this video, add your comments and questions below, and subscribe for more.